Well, hey, welcome to Tech 37. My name is Rob Boyd. Today's show is about security, specifically security architecture. We've got three different experts with us today, each representing a heavy duty background in different areas of security, all the way from a services and financial standpoint, all the way through to architecture and on through to automation and things that we're doing from a cloud perspective that perhaps we should all be looking a little bit closer at. It's about having a methodology. It's about developing an architecture that involves making good decisions up front so that we're not having to reverse ourselves later and declare that we wasted investments, we wasted time, all the things that we don't want to do when it comes to any projects like this. Well, we've got some smart people with us on the show today, three different experts from Worldwide Technology, again, each with a vast background. You're going to enjoy this one. It's Tech 37, your source for technology, education, and collaboration. My name is Rob Boyd. Let's go have a show. All right, so here we go. We got our distinguished panel from Worldwide Technology, and I would like to go through some quick introductions just to make sure I don't mess up anybody's background because everybody has an interesting background to play a different part in this discussion. But Chris, let's start with you. I wonder if you could give us a little bit of your background and uh, what's important to understand. Sure, absolutely. First of all, thank you for having me. Uh, so I'm Chris Conrad. I'm Director of Security for our Global Financial Services business here at WWT. Been with the organization now for six years. I've been in the, the cybersecurity business uh, for 23 years. And I'll just say that over that time, I've seen a lot change, but I also have seen too much stay the same. So really interested in the conversation we're gonna have today. Yeah, I do find it interesting. Every security conversation has some element of something we've all been saying for a long time. And, um, but it also keeps everybody in business to a certain extent because it just feels like uh, there's always something to patch. There's always some basics that are being ignored. Um, and as unsexy as it can be, though, those are good things to continue to hammer on because we're going to still have to do it. But as long as this business involves users, until we can get rid of the users, I think we're going to always be struggling with some level of security. Uh, and as far as I know, they're, they're not uh, optional in most situations. Well, uh, let's jump over to Mark Wall. Mark, uh, we've talked once before, but I'm uh, enjoying having you in this conversation again. I think it'll be good. I wonder if you could give us a little bit of your background. Yeah, thanks. Um, so my name is Mark Wall, practice manager here at Worldwide Technology. I look after uh, a lot of the automation side. And if you mm -hmm. kind of think about it, a lot of the, you know, opera, opera can't say the word operationalizing, um, you know, how do we, how do we remove toil? How do we improve efficiencies? How do we provide better time to value? So, you know, with the, with the security industry always changing, as you said, and, and things are always evolving, you know, how do we better connect systems and, and, and mitigate risk and do, you know, a lot of those type of things. So really excited to be here today. Yeah. And I it just, it's, it's, boy, there's a clue right there as to where we might be going in the conversation. Um, so that'll be interesting as well, because I think uh, automation itself, just as a general category, holds some very real promise to solving, um, at the very least, fat finger issues or things that just repetitive mistakes, perhaps. But we'll get more into that in just a moment. Uh, well, Kent, I wonder if you give us a little bit of your background as well, sir. Sure. Kent Noyes. I'm a distinguished architect in the global security practice here worldwide. I've been here for 20 years, based in St. Louis at our headquarters. Uh, been here a long time, so I've been in various practices over time. Uh, my second, second stint through security, I've been in security now seven or eight years with Chris. And, uh, uh, you know, architecture is definitely sort of a passion of mine as it's woven into business and operational needs. So looking forward to the conversation. Well, let's get started with that conversation then. So uh, I'm going to come back and start with Chris since I did the introduction there first. But to kind of set us off, uh, I wonder... You know, we've talked for we've on Tech 37 anyway. We've been had multiple security conversations. Some, uh, you know, more technical than others. Some more business oriented than others. Today, mm -hmm. one of the contrasts that feels like it's very important here is that we want to have an architectural discussion. So, in terms of setting that up, Chris, I wonder if you could kind of set the stage for why architecture. Assuming I'm saying it right, but when we talk about security architecture, where does the importance of that begin to lend itself to a, to this conversation? Yeah, I'll just I'll first start by saying that every organization really needs to understand, you know, what levels of risk that they're currently operating at. So whether it's from a technological standpoint or a programmatic standpoint, that's the fundamental thing they need to do first is understand what levels of risk they are they're operating at. And once they know that, they can really begin to accelerate the maturity of their cybersecurity program. And candidly, it all starts with architecture. And so you have to have a good, solid architecture uh, externally, internally, and across the board. So 
uh, once you have that, you really then can begin to accelerate the maturity of your program and then focus on other areas of, of cybersecurity. Well, I know we're going to have a we're going to dive deeper into some specifics around different articles. One thing I love about working with you guys is that you all publish quite a bit. Um, I don't know if someone's got something over your head saying publish, publish, because I know it's not easy. Uh, but I do love the fact that you guys are constantly putting out information and you're uh, and, and putting your thoughts down uh, in writing, which will link to those things. But one of the points that was made in one of the papers that was a good lead into this discussion was the notion of pursuing logical security architecture uh, over uh, more perhaps tactical, I guess, the difference between what you want to do first before you um, start running after shiny objects. Um, Kent, I wonder if you could speak to uh, what's important about going first when it comes to running after security issues and, and where we need to place things. Yeah, the logical architecture is important because there's so many tools. It's so complicated in the security world. It's almost random. And for all engineers, we want to act. We want to get things done. We want to check boxes and get things done. But that logical architecture keeps you essentially, it's kind of product independent. It keeps you from getting distracted by the product choices you're going to make and that you focus uh, specifically on the security needs and the priorities based on risk, as Chris kind of talked about. Once you kind of have risk organized, you know where to prioritize, you can then set up policies and you kind of categorize what solutions and products you're going to apply to security and security controls that are necessary. If you start getting too fast into the products themselves, you can kind of get lost, caught up in it, and it really confuses things going forward. That's the way I look at it. Mark, That's I see the you need nodding. For the yeah. Logical. Yeah. Does everything make sense to you, Mark? Yeah. And, you know, it, 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 I, we see a lot of these, I think, uh, conversations going on with customers where it's, uh, I'm reminded of, um, for those of you playing the home game, there's uh, Joe Weber, who's on our cloud team, um, founded the, 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 the Worldwide Bald Men's Club or something. And, and he gave me a quote. It's, he used it in the Air Force. It's called Vector versus Velocity, right? Meaning, um, you know, do, do, I, do, I, do I have a, a strategic plan? Do I need to, you know, move something forward um, pragmatically? Or do I need to just get something done and be you know, very tactical and focused? And I definitely, you know, agree that, you know, there's a lot of tools and shiny objects. You definitely need a plan. You need a framework to operate in, but you know where we see a lot of customers challenge too is just getting some momentum, getting some wins, building that 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 uh, you know that 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 multiplying factor, getting that flywheel going in certain areas, and, and getting the you know the teams on board. But it definitely has to be grounded in some overarching you know plan. Doesn't have to be completely fleshed out and be 100 percent perfect, right? That the cost of perfection is is infinite, right? You're never going to get there, but you need something that is going to align the teams to be able to move forward, you know, better together. Um, and so, you know, whether it's security, whether it's automation, whether it's, you know, other areas of business, it seems to come up quite a bit. We talk yeah, I'll just add to that, Mark, as well, that you talked about operationalization of, of security tools at the top of the call, and that's a big problem. I mean, everybody buys so many different security platforms. Uh, as you know, the average enterprise has something like 75 to 100 different unique security products. And then what we're seeing is that they're just sitting there stale. They're not integrated into other platforms. They're not communicating with each other. And that goes back to the fundamentals that Kent was talking about around architecture. Until you have that, you can't move forward. Well, there's some first things first uh, type of lessons to be gleaned from, from what I was reading. I think, Kent, I think it was your name that was on the article. But it was this notion, and as Mark mentions, uh, people and teams and getting them involved – I think you specifically had called this out as the importance of stakeholder involvement as, as being uh, something that needs to be established first and foremost, because if you don't, then you've just completely increased your risk, which we're talking a lot about here, but there's a slightly different area, risk of failure in terms of your project and implementation, especially down the road if you don't have buy-off early on. Can you speak to the importance of stakeholder involvement and where that fits into a process of pursuing a security architecture? Definitely. I mean, it's one of the biggest obstacles, I think, to progress that there is out there. And it's not just that if the stakeholders aren't involved, they're not involved. It's not that it, it may block it. You may have to reverse it. We've been in customers where segmentation is a great example. Security is woven into everything. Segmentation, particularly, you know, kind of separating out resources within an organization based on risk. Um, segmentation specifically requires a lot of parties to be involved. And if they're not, we've seen organizations rip out hundreds or thousands of firewalls, pull them back out after they just put them in three or four years ago because they didn't 
involve the stakeholders in the overall planning. They made a product decision without involving those stakeholders. And then it caused them to reverse, not only stop it, but reverse, but also, you know, segmentation in the data center, for example, you're in touchy environments. And if you don't get all the stakeholders involved and they don't have buy-in, you're not going to move an inch. You're not going to be able to move forward. And so we see a ton of stalled micro segmentation projects. And we have over the past few years as I've kind of specialized in that, uh, mainly because it's not a technical issue at all. It's mainly just because they're not all bought in. And you, once you get moving, somebody will back you up and think that they have another a better idea, you know, or they just won't like your idea and they won't participate. They won't move quickly. So it's a, it's a huge deal in security because of the nature of security woven into everything that's out there. Yeah, it's interesting how we can become so, everything feels like my priority. And I know if I understand the network, and I know most of the users have no idea how complicated the network is, then it, it, it sometimes I always feel like if I'm going to get this done, the last thing I want to do is go bother a bunch of people because I'll never get my stuff done. But then I, in, in my experience also has been, I'll end up spending twice as much on the back end, though, fighting for justification or, uh, or trying to resell something that has already been purchased. Uh, and is already in motion, but is at risk of, of not fulfilling its promised potential because I didn't involve the right people from the get-go. Um, I'm curious if you, because I, I would imagine you all are seeing this from different levels, but obviously there's been, we're all working from home. Uh, there's been a, a you know explosion of work from home. And for, even though some people have started to go back to work and some people have to go back to work, but um, there seems to be a strong indication that there is going to be a balance for the long term of people embracing more work from home, which I have to think increases the security kind of a attack surface, so to speak. I'm curious what you guys have seen, both either from customers or just in general reality. Do you think it's going to stick and how does that change the yeah. importance and our approach to security architecture? Yeah, I can speak just working with a number of large global financials. I mean, they put you know, hundreds of thousands of, of their employees uh, to work remotely. And from what I'm hearing is that there, it's going to be a permanent thing. So maybe only 40% of their workforce is going to go back. So they successfully got everybody to work from home. Now they got to think about re-architecting that network and what does that look like? And let's do it securely moving forward. And it's, it's more than just work from home. It's really work from anywhere. And so we're starting to get into more and more conversations about we got to think about segmentation. We got to think about our secure access service edge or the, the SASE model. And what does that look like? So uh, that's top of mind with, with everybody now. Well, I'm glad yeah, you brought that up because, yeah, I want to get into that. Go ahead, Mark. Yeah, just maybe add on the, the other side of that, too, that we're seeing is um, there's the, the, the support side of the organization internally to operate mm -hmm. working from home. But then even, you know, the customers are really being, I'm sorry, um, our customers organizations are being forced to 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 transform digitally to provide mm -hmm. services and goods for their customers right so the yeah. the demand of you know simple things like curbside pickups uh you know ordering online some of these in-person sort of experiences are, are are drastically changing or or scaling differently so the need to provide you know those applications those services directly you know, via the internet and, and, and digitally are becoming paramount. Um, a lot of organizations are rushing into that, rightfully so, because of just, you know, the, the, the cost of doing business. Um, but now it's like, hey, I, I kind of rushed. Are, are these applications secure? Am I, am I, am I exposed because I kind of hurried up and, and, and did these things yeah. because of just the, the, the economic sort of impact of what's going on? So definitely seeing a lot of, uh, a lot of these conversations come up more and more as, Hey, I needed to respond, but how do I maybe not take a step back, but but look at things maybe more holistically and put a better strategy going forward? Well, I'm curious if this if this went through your heads at all, because obviously you know you've been in security and specifically you guys have all been around the networks um, your entire career. But it feels like everything that has had to happen has happened in many cases much quicker than we thought we even could do it in certain situations. Yeah. But then I always worry about security with that because security is the last thing, even when you're planning stuff out. So God forbid when you're not even planning, um, then it's definitely coming in a secondary to just connectivity. But it feels like there was some kind of a, in a, the politest way I can say it, but I'm a, I told you so from a business resilience perspective in that um, I think we've been sounding that bell, ringing that bell, whatever the right terminology is from a resilience perspective saying you need to adopt remote work, everything from understanding it from a cultural management perspective all the way through to a how do we make it work perspective because it, it speaks to the agility that everyone needs a bit more of. So I feel like if there's anything good that maybe comes out of everything that we're going through is 
once again, there's always moves in the market, you know, that have been happening all the time. This is certainly a big one, but companies that have embraced these kind of changes and get good at operating in the new normal are going to obviously do well coming out the other side. And security is a way to continue that at an accelerated pace, uh, I feel like. And so um, you were mentioning the SA- SASE, I think, is that the right way to put it? But, and I had to write this sure. out because I get mixed up on our acronyms, but so secure. What is it? Secure Access Services Edge. Did I get that right? Yep. Who okay. can explain what that is? And let's get into some some details about that because I think that's really what you guys are encouraging is something I haven't heard enough about. Yeah, so I could probably jump in on that. And, and I think the pandemic, as you kind of talked through it a little bit, you're alluding to it, kind of accelerated that whole thing. But when you think about it, and this is where SASE is coming about, it was already an inevitability. Users were already starting to be everywhere, you know, coffee shops and home and everywhere as we know. But applications are starting to be everywhere as well. They're, the destinations of those users are starting to be everywhere, on-prem, in the public cloud, in public cloud infrastructure. And so it only makes sense for, you know, instead of a, forcing a lot of hairpinning of those users going to those resources through central locations, you'd want your security stack to be everywhere as well mm-hmm. that you go through to get to them. So Secure Access Services Edge is kind of like, just think of it like remote access security as a service, okay? A provider will build up your typical security stack that you go through, like say you go in through a VPN to your home office or whatever, there's gonna be a security stack with things in it like DLP and CASB and all these security controls, firewalls and IPS and all those things, okay? What SASE is, they basically, is, is providers are putting that security stack up in a cloud, abstracting away the details of it and allowing you to connect to the nearest one to you as a user, you're at home, you connect to the nearest one in the cloud to you Remote access as a service, you go through it. From there, you can divert straight to SaaS applications in the cloud, or you can divert to your on-prem if you want to. But it's just an extension to me of taking users that are everywhere, applications that are everywhere. Now you need your security stack everywhere that you go through to get to them because because it is everywhere. You know, it's much more distributed, much more dynamic. Much well, faster. Now you, you guys have worked with tons of different vendors and services. Um, and I was reading something, so forgive me, I'm, I'm winging this out here, so I hope I'm right. Did I read, is it Worldwide Technologies Security Services is a billion-dollar market, a, a billion-dollar business? Um, you guys, I didn't realize how much you've been doing. And 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 I with along with that, and knowing your background, because I've worked with you from a product and technology perspective, I am the guy that tries to convince everybody to run after shiny objects, or at least historically I've been. Um, and the idea is... Um, it, it feels like you do need something that's more nimble and you need something that's more accessible for, as you're saying, everybody's in different locations. And so this old model of stacking stuff up at a single location and racking and, you know, racking it for access and then trying to connect everything to it isn't going to, isn't going to fly at all. And that's never, and it, we've said that before, but I don't think it's ever been more obvious than it is now. Um, what's the importance in this, it would come to you, Mark, uh, the importance of automation when it comes to, uh, uh, the implementation of an architectural model uh, in this direction that Kent's speaking to. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and, you know, it, it's kind of some of the conversation earlier, you know, it, th- there's levels of abstraction, right? So as much as I can say, hey, what are all the the systems that, that need to, to pass, uh, you know, certain data back and forth, and as well as, um, you know, providing integration with that. But even if, you know, to start simply, abstracting away the, the the nerd knobs, right? How do I reduce the human factor and say, if I have to I'm oversimplify and configure this firewall, configuring this remote access policy, configuring, you know, this, this, this network device, how do I create essentially templates, right? That I can sort of abstract away all of the complexity in that and provide that security policy that I can then programmatically apply no matter where. So if I have you know, 10 instances around the globe, um, and it's this sort of security stack, I can apply that in real time at the push of a button, right? So if I have to make a a change, or I have to delete a user, if I have to update a policy, I can update that once and programmatically push that out really across the board. And so it really allows you to to, to operate faster. And and, and probably one of the biggest themes we're seeing in automation is, is it's not just efficiency, it's accuracy. Right. It's how 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 I can remove the human element. How can I reduce risk of if I have to touch 10 different devices and tools? How can I make sure that um, I'm consistent um, in, in what I'm in what I'm applying, not just from a compliance or an auditing, but just from a 
you know, what is the cost of fat fingering a device in, in the world we are today? If, if your application's down, if, if you get you get impacted from a service, I mean, what is that cost when everything now is digital in real time? Um, it, it's immense going forward. What? Yeah, and I'll just uh, add to that too, Mark, with the extreme shortage of skilled resources that we have in the industry. I think the last study I saw from IC Square was uh, 3 million jobs short. So there's not enough security professionals that are out there today. So every department is understaffed. And so how can we automate many of these mundane tasks that, that need to be done every day? So automation is top of mind with just about every single organization that we're working with today. It's just a matter of trying to figure out exactly what those use cases are to help them with their efficiency. Well, one thing yeah, I think and- Kent said it in his article too. No, I'll come back to you though, but Kent said in his article, and I really like this because I pulled it out, was this idea of increased automation means less operation. Um, and so you're, you're making the task of operations simpler when you've automated away, as you're saying, Mark, the, the repetitive things, the things that shouldn't require a human. And I just wonder, I'll let you guys then comment on this one again, but I think it was Chris that started off at the top of this conversation talking about how as we've run first after gear, have we run after shiny objects to implement, um, and a lot of them don't work well together, I feel like some people run after automation as a secondary impulse to try and make things work together that really weren't designed to work together from the get-go uh, because the bottom line is we're seeing the challenge of having humans in between those processes uh, doing mm-hmm. things that theoretically are simple, but it requires a human because these, you know, A doesn't talk to B uh, in this type of thing. And it feels like if you start with the architectural standpoint like you guys are professing and, and, and preaching here, then it feels like you could maybe avoid a lot of that and the faster we get to that, the better. But back back to you and what you were saying, um, uh, uh, Mark. Sorry. Yeah, no, absolutely. I think having that, you know, the 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 architecture of what you're looking at and kind of rallying around, and then you know, as you kind of have that defined, we have a, um, uh, you know, a, a common tool that we use. Right. It's it's not necessarily a, a literal tool, but a we call it a process it's called value stream mapping. Right. Okay. It's sort of somewhat of a manufacturing yeah. concept. So, yeah. you know, as you have your architecture and where you want to go and what you're driving towards, there's still the current state and future state of where you want to be. So taking and thinking things in, in, in the, in the uh, thought process of a system and thinking of things in the process of like how a manufacturer, like if I'm building a car, right. And I got to, you know, build the chassis, drop the engine in, move it on to this next thing. It's not that unsimilar to IT organizations and, and our security organizations. So being able to sort of say, hey, what is what is the, the, the flow of work? What do I have to do to 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 resolve an incident or or you know push a button here, 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 and here to to you know configure a new policy. Really taking the time to map those out and then defining you know, what, what is that value that I'm looking for? Because that'll help you not only understand where can I make the most impact, it's going to make sure that you're including the right people. As we said earlier, bringing in the different teams, if it requires six different teams to do sort of one change, right? Getting all parties on board, understanding the flow of work, and then sort of attacking how I can automate that is really going to make everybody's lives better. But more importantly, for, for some organizations, right, budget's a concern. Right. Yeah. It's like, hey, I want to do automation. I want to do these things. But help me understand the, the the impact. Right. When you when you map out a process, you can put you can quantify it. Hey, it takes these amount of people, this amount of time. There's a time to value cost. And there's even a cost of operational time. Hey, if I'm paying this team X amount of money and they're spending 95 percent of their time doing these you know, repetitive tasks, we can move them on to uh, different areas of the business or different projects that are going to be much more impactful. So going through and doing concepts like value stream mapping, not only create efficiencies and impact, you can create a return on investment model to help you get more budget or help you sort of, you know, pr- project, um, you know, future return dollars uh, to your different parts of the business. So we're seeing that become more and more popular is, you know, taking a couple uh, steps here to kind of organize your strategy, look at your flow of work, and then quantifying all that is really going to give you the ammo that you need within your organization to, to make some change. There's, there's Rob, there's two, there's two things. We've moved way up in the architectural process here. Um, much earlier than we used to do it is discovery is one because we're dealing with complicated brownfield environments, so visibility mm-hmm. discovery. But this 
workflow automation he's talking about, right on the front end of the process of your, of your technical architecture design, we hit that pretty early because it affects your decisions. If you're working with things that don't have APIs or don't play well together, you need to kind of know what your processes are going to be before even the architecture is built. So we used to kind of put it in the middle or towards the end. We, we build it, then we're going to you know automate the architecture much, much earlier now because it's such a big deal. It's almost a matter of survival in the security world right now. So we get a good early start on that. Well, I love yeah, the fact just, what you're uh, saying there is you're learning as you go and you're, you're changing, you're, you're working on your own value streams and kind of re- right working the process that you then share with customers as we learn better ways to do things. But yeah. Sorry. Go ahead, Chris. No, I was just going to, I was going to add to what Ken and Mark were talking about and you guys well know is, you know, visibility is key and just people don't know what's on their network, you know, whether it's just devices on their network or whether it's applications, like just who's talking to what. And as Kent, you talked about moving that up uh, further along in the architecture discussion. Now people have an understanding. They can see everything that they have on their network and they can move at acceleration. So you guys are reminding me of a previous show that we did, and I don't know the episode number, but it was another Tech 37 show, and I want to say it was Todd Nielsen, um, where we had talked about the importance of, in a, in a process for kind of identifying risk within a business um, and, and narrowing down so that you're working on the things that have the, because security ultimately is a reduction of risk. It's never an elimination. It's never uh, the idea of just getting done. You know, security is that project we did last year. You know, it, it's always reducing the things that have the biggest threat to the business. So you're not wasting money fighting something that may be important because it made the news, but it may have nothing to do with your business. And it feels like that works its way into the value stream. Can you help me understand because I think that's got to be present as part of the process. But this, when you speak to this visual exercise of value stream mapping, um, where does that work itself in? I assume it's somewhere near the top of the pre-architecture discussion. Yeah, yeah, I can I can chime in, and then if Kent, Chris, you want to add color. So you know, and sometimes it's even I would say parallel as part of bigger bigger engagements that we work on with customers. So the idea is. You know, if we're defining what the end state and the goal looks like, we still need to do some discovery and map out what's our current state so we can get to that future state, right? So sometimes it's somewhat of a parallel effort in saying, hey, you know, what 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 is sort of somewhat of a governance model? What does the architecture look like? What are some of the policies that we want to tackle and enforce? And where do we start, right? It's always a here's a roadmap, here's a strategic roadmap, here's some of the the technical roadmap, even to be able to make sure that the design, the architecture, and sort of the process side, you know, somewhat, uh, you know, definitely, definitely mesh together. But I think as early as you can have those conversations, however, you need to know where you're going to be. So you need to define a little bit of the end state and be yeah. comfortable with where you want to go. And then you can have that process sort of uh, a conversation go on, you know, a little bit after that. Um, so you know where you're going to end up being and, and you can make the, uh, the best determination of that. And, and so is it true, Chris, that you guys can do this with any customer in under an hour? I'm just kidding. Um, yeah, it's around 45 minutes. You can get 45 it yeah. minutes. Yeah, I thought I knew I had it wrong. Um, <laughs> no, as I think about the kind of engagements that you guys do, and you're one of the most consultative partners I've ever had the benefit of working with. Um, but obviously, this is a multi-part process that involves different people. So it's obviously you're not just working with a chief security officer or just working with the IT manager or something like this. Um, can one of you perhaps share a, just a little bit of an understanding? Because one of the takeaways from this is we're going to share some resources, both for I believe you guys will actively do value stream mapping as a specific workshop with customers. Um, and I'm sure you've got some other workshops and or uh, things that maybe are more generalized or very specific, perhaps as to where everybody, anybody feels like their next step is. But who typically needs to be involved for you to, to start um figuring out where the value is going to come from in a process like this. What do you like to see? Yeah, and I guess I can answer that a couple of different ways. I mean, at, at WWT, we have a variety of different consultative services that we provide an organization with. It could be everything from a, a briefing to a workshop, but everything starts really with an assessment. As I said at the top of the call, just understanding, you know, what levels of risk they're currently operating at. And we could be talking to an architecture team. We can be talking to, a data center team, we could be talking to the security team. Just first of all, what is it you're trying to accomplish? What is it you're trying to protect? What's the most important thing? And then working with them to design an appropriate level of assessment that can include you know, interviews and documentation review, 
uh, diagram reviews, but could also be some vulnerability scanning and some form of reviews of their network architecture. And then once we have that, then, as I said earlier, we can really start to accelerate and prioritize and categorize the things they need to do to, to fix their program. Curious, how often do you have customers that come in? Because I feel like, you know, in this perfect world we speak of now, we're speaking of that, that imaginary world and the way I see it, where customers are thinking about all the different projects well beyond security or networking, you know, generally, mm -hmm. uh, that they have to be concerned with from an investment perspective to their shareholders or whatever it may be. Uh, and then, but, but in security, somehow always seems to end up at the end of that priority list. Do you have customers that are proactively saying, we know we're not on top of where we need to be, or do you find most customers responding to the fact that something happened and now we need to come to you and help us get our act together because one, we need, maybe we need help putting out the fire that's currently burning, but then we also, it, it was a wake up call to realize that we need to do a better job of this going forward. Where are you seeing people in that kind of continuum right now? Yeah, I'll just, I'll go first here and just say that, uh, first of all, it depends upon what industry they're in. If they're a heavily regulated industry, so whether it's healthcare or finance or retail, they're going to be taking security a little bit more seriously, potentially. There's going to be a little bit more budget added to their security program uh, because of all the various uh, regulations that they need to adhere to for their program. So that's one. So that's a, that's a different level. And then as you, you know, the re regular enterprise customers, um, you know, where they are privately held, privately financed, maybe they don't have those regulations they need to adhere to. But then the, the CEOs of the organizations are very concerned about protecting the confidentiality, the integrity and the availability of their greatest asset, which is information. So that has another level of priority. So it really all depends yeah. on what industry they're in and who's telling them to do something about it. I would agree with Chris completely. It's a mixed bag. We're seeing them come in. You know, we ask those questions right off the bat, you know, pretty much any workshop or briefing, like what's more what of the drivers and it's, it's pretty split these days. There's a lot going on in the news. There's a lot going on in the industry. There's a lot going on in the companies that doesn't get revealed, you know, in the organizations that may not get revealed out, outbound, but they've got them. And then there's compliance, there's fines, there's all kinds of things going on that, uh, you know, we're, I mean, we're in a good industry for us, you know, we're in a good industry because of that. It's a nice rich industry with lots going on in it. Uh, but the, the industry has a long way to go. Has a long yeah. way to go to kind of get all under control. And we keep redefining it. So it's probably going to continue that way to some certain extent, perhaps. And I don't know, that makes it fun. If everything was easy, that everybody would be doing it, I guess. Um, well, you guys, obviously, so you, you're talking about building architecture and the importance of architecture first. Uh, because I, And it really reminds me of the, the, the proverbs about, you know, knowing the plans of something uh, before you, you know, to lay your foundation. I'm mixing them all up at this point. But I think you know what I mean. Um, Hopefully everybody understands without the actual words matching what's in happening inside my head. Uh, but I want to just go around the horn real quick as we wrap things up. As far as next steps, uh, you guys, we mentioned the value stream mapping workshop as being something to go forward with. Um, and we've also mentioned that there's a number of different articles, which we'll link to here as well, that are good for further reading. But if someone was going to take a step, we always encourage everyone to interact with the platform. Um, you guys have incredible resources there in St. Louis, but you've made those available remotely. And so it's not a matter of being anywhere near the St. Louis area to be able to take advantage of people like yourself, if not yourselves directly, uh, but also just the, um, the infrastructure that you are able to build, test, and showcase, and, and, and various things with. What would you recommend next? Uh, Chris, I'll start with you. Yeah, what I would recommend next for, for any organization is, is to visit www.t.com and take a look at all the various ATC insights or briefings or articles or labs. Everybody's in a different part of the journey around cybersecurity. Security is a process and never ends. So depending upon where you are, but then go straight to the platform to go look for that information because of all the great subject matter experts we have across you know, cloud and networking and automation can really give you some ideas to brainstorm. You know what? I think I need to have Worldwide come in and do a briefing on this particular subject. But I think that's a great place to go. And as a matter of fact, I'm telling a lot of younger professionals, people that are in colleges, you know, where can I learn? I want to build a lab. Well, go to our platform. Start there and learn. It's the first step. Yeah. How about you, uh, Kent? 
Uh, yeah, I'm going to cheat this a little bit. I'm going to say internally, everything starts with risk. Just spread the good word. Make sure that they're thinking risk-minded and what they prioritize. You got to spread that. Not only security teams often know that. You got to spread that to. There's a formal way to do that. Spread that to the network teams. Spread it to the other teams that are involved. Back to the stakeholder concept. Um, but I would have to reemphasize what he said about our content and strategy. A lot of it's placed out, and it gives you a way to start if you get out on the platform. The articles that you've referenced, I would, would touch those. But you know, if your use case it depends on your use case. You know, if you're talking about some of the ones we're talking about here, like SASE or Zero Trust, there are on-demand labs that are out there to let you specifically compare solutions against each other. There's articles about. There's guidance about risk and everything that we've talked about here out there. So I, you know, I don't want to. Yeah. <laughs> Mark's probably going to say the same thing, but you know, I don't want to push it too hard. But that's, we do have a lot of good info out there, and we're pumping it in. Uh, you know out there daily. Well, I think that SASE security model, S-A-S-E, I, is, is interesting to me because I haven't heard enough people talking about that. Maybe it's just because my head is stuck in the past. Uh, it could be the big issue here. I just was laughing internally. Well, maybe it showed on my face as well. But Kent, when you said, I was just going to summarize, Kent is pro-spread and sort of spreading risk. I'm like, Wait a minute, that's probably not the right, the right. Uh, probably not a good way to put that. No. Yeah, but I know what you Please mean. No. The idea is we need to all understand the role that that is played with that and how we can reduce risk in the right areas, um, and invest properly with that. But uh, so, final words, which no pressure on you whatsoever, Mark. Um, you're you've been working with automation and really pushing that envelope and saying we should be doing less, which I know hasn't probably resulted in you doing less. Uh, but yeah, what do you? What's your takeaway from today's conversation? Yeah. And, and, you know, if you look at, you know, security or you look at other areas, we sort of rally around, there's three things you need. You need strategy, you need a plan, right? You need to organize uh, what you're doing. You need to be able to execute, right? You need the resources to do it. There's a third bucket, right? It's enablement. You need your teams, and you need to give them the, the, the tools and the ability to operate efficiently, right? So a lot of, you know, what we talked about today, there's a lot of learning labs. We actually did another Tech 37 on on uh, unicorns, right? You can't just continue to hire these you know, resources that are expected to know this tool, this tool, this tool. But if you if you really focus on enabling your teams or yourself, right? If you're very interested, we have a lot of great labs, a lot of great content, right? Of you know what are ten things you need to know to 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 build out uh, sort of a dev secops career. What are what are some great hands on resources for you to learn programmability concepts and and call it kick the tires in a safe controlled mm -hmm. environment to make you know this firewall talk to you know this system here and, and really automate those processes so we have a lot of that great strategy and, and other content and use cases but we also have some really cool hands-on you know learning labs that can really help you up level your skills or your team skills to really operate more efficiently yeah, and I love the way you brought it back around to the people and because we started off kind of talking about the need to engage stakeholders earlier in the process when you're talking about uh, where and how to build an architecture. So you cover the importance of building an architecture, but you have to have the right people involved from the get go. And that's the only way you're going to be able to move it forward efficiently because it'll come back to bite you. If you cut that corner, <laughs> it's going to come back and get you here at some point. And it sounds like you guys preach that consistently. Gentlemen, thank you so much for taking the time to join us for this latest episode of Tech 37. Uh, to our audience, of course, appreciate your time as well i uh, hope you enjoyed this one please continue to let us know what you want to hear more of and the best way to do that of course is to interact with these professionals uh, on the platform which is wwt.com my name is rob boyd you've been watching tech 37 your source for technology education and collaboration we'll see you on the next one